it is, it is so funny. It's so funny because really with the book of Revelation, what you really get in, in theology this and in is a demonstration view of so Wirecast is you get really a culmination of the entire Bible. I, I know you guys have noticed that. So many different themes in theology, and so much of it refers back to something that happened in Genesis, or especially the book of Daniel is tremendous, especially right now where we are. Right now where we are, just about all of Daniel 7 corresponds with where we are right now. And uh, much of, uh, of the other passages in Daniel, of the book of Daniel, you know, uh, really, uh, and I don't mean to, to go back, I'm not planning to go back and read any of it, but I just want to say to you that <clears throat> a lot of the symbolism that is used here in this 13th chapter is also used in Daniel chapter 7, where he sees these world empires coming up out of the sea. And he sees the same, the same figures that John sees here. He sees a leopard and a bear and a lion. And then this conglomerate beast this is that is really like an amalgamation of, of all of them. And, of course, they represent empires. They represent Gentile empires that will rule the world. And what Daniel sees as future prophecy at the time Daniel was written about what's going to happen in the, at the end times and the tribulation and so forth. Of course, John is seeing it as it currently is happening where the Lord has him in, in the visions of Revelation. So it's, it's, really, it's really interesting how um, all of that this just ties is a together. This demonstration and how of Wirecast. The, the words that Jesus spoke when he was here on earth about the end times and I've mentioned that to you, but in case you, you, you don't know, if there are two chapters that really, if you just read those two chapters, it'll kind of give you an idea of what's going on right about where we are right now in chapter 13. Chapter 13 happens right in the middle of tribulation. So the, the seven years of tribulation are divided into the first three and a half years. This that's called is a tribulation. demonstration of The last cast. three and a half years are called great tribulation. And different things happen in each one. <clears throat> in, in the first half of tribulation, you have an antichrist that is introduced in the breaking of the first seal. And the breaking of the first seal releases a rider on a white horse. And this rider has um, a crown, but it's not a diadem. It's not a kingly crown. It's the crown of, an, of like an Olympic champion. So, in other words, it's, it's like an imitation. Of it, it, it's, he's presenting himself as a champion, but, he, but he's, he's not a king. And he has a bow, but he has no arrows, and he goes forth to conquer the world. So, the, the point of that, the implication of that, is that when the first seal is broken, a, a spirit is going to be released onto this earth that is going to allow a person a real human flesh and blood person to begin to take this over is the a world demonstration of without Wirecast. a war. In other words, like a, a peaceful coup almost. And he's going to be able to uh, control the world. And, and, you know, you might find this a little bit odd and you think, man, how in the world could that happen? Because now we're looking at our world now and we see a raucous place. I mean, we see... Uh, world empires that are very nationalistic. And I know that, uh, you know, in, in America over the past eight years or so, 10 of years or so, maybe even 12 years or so, we have been moving toward a more globalistic uh, look at life where we, we're concerned about uh, other nations of the, of the world and, and we're in packs, we're in, we're in agreements with nations and, and other parts of the world and the European countries and China and, and, and we have these uh, North American free trade. We, in other words, everything about our country this is a has been up of until now, basically moving it toward being a part of a big global empire. I mean, one world kind of a deal. And of course, you know, back in, what is it, the 50s when the, uh, 
uh, when the UN came in, was it the 50s, I believe? And of course, back then, you know, all the Bible scholars were talking about, well, this is that end time stuff where the whole world's going to be brought together. Yeah, one world government, one world police force, one world economic this power, and so forth. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. And then, when the European common market came into play, uh, where England has just voted, what was it, a couple of years ago, Brexit where they voted to exit the European common market uh, and, and the EU. And, and of course, that, all of that has to do with uh, a, a section of the world that is definitely described in the book of Revelation. And it's, as a matter of fact, you, we'll see it described here as a, as a, this is a, as demonstration a kingdom, of pretty cast. much. The, the beast that you see, the dragon with the seven heads and the ten horns, and the ten crowns on the ten horns, that's describing an empire. It's describing what is, what is called, and, and the reason it's called this is because we don't really know all the nations that are in it at any given time per se, and that's a revival of the old Roman Empire. The Roman Empire obviously was the ruler of the world for a good this portion a of, of the history of, 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 of ancient history. And they ruled with a rod of iron. And, and you know, it was Rome that came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and tore the temple down and, uh, and, and, and basically <laughs> cast the Jews into dispersion where they were just scattered all over the world. So from 70 AD, roughly, you know, when Titus, the Roman general, comes in and, and, and captures Jerusalem and destroys the temple and basically puts them to flight all over the world. This is a the demonstration Jews have of been, were spread all over the world. And until May 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation again, there was no nation of Israel from 70 AD until 1948. And never in the history of the world has that ever happened to any other nation or any other people ever in the history of the world where they lose their land, they lose their language, they lose their culture, this they lose their people, they lose Wirecast. their money, and they are ever brought back to be a nation again. But on May 14, 1948, Israel, the flag of Israel flew over the nation and they became a nation again. Uh, and, and from that point forward, uh, most of us and most of the Bible leaders and most of the history and, and prophetic teachers and so forth <clears throat> have kind of sat on the edge of our seat because now uh, all the prophecies that this the Bible speaks about the nation Wirecast. of Israel can, can come true. Up until that time, it wasn't possible for that to happen because there was no nation of Israel, right? I mean, there was, there was, there was, there was no no uh, uh, Jewish woman. Chapter twelve describes uh, the woman that is birthing the child, and the dragon's trying to eat the child. You know, you remember that. Uh, there is no woman, no Israel, and so it would be impossible for all of the events that we're reading right now to have happened, because there this was no a city of Jerusalem of uh, ruled by the Jewish nation. There was no future site of the temple that would be rebuilt because there were no people to rebuild it. It didn't, it wouldn't have made sense or, or anything. And, and so uh, now we, we find ourselves in, in a time where these prophecies can be fulfilled. And so what we're looking at when we start looking at these passages, especially chapter 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, all of those right in there, we're, we're looking at a a period of time this that happens is a demonstration of after Wirecast. the first three and a half years of tribulation when the Antichrist is trying to make friends with Israel, trying to be friends with Israel, trying to convince Israel that he has her best interest at heart. Uh, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He, he, he convinces Israel that he is for her. And uh, we'll look in just a moment at a passage of Scripture, but uh, the, the Antichrist, I believe, personally, is a Gentile. This now, is I, a demonstration I, 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 of Wirecast. I'll show you why in just a minute. 
But the, the, the false prophet, which you'll see in just a minute in chapter 13, there are two beasts that are introduced in chapter 13. <clears throat> and, the, and the Bible calls them beasts because that's what they really are. I mean, God says that these are two beasts. One comes up out of the sea and one comes up out of the earth or basically the land. Uh, and they're, they are, uh, their natures are, are beastly, you know, even though they are, they'll be seen on earth as human this beings is a or as people of that wire would be cast. normal people like us. They, obviously, they're not going to look like a dragon and they're not going to look like, a, you know, seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns and two horns and a lamb's head and all. I mean, they're obviously not going to be beast grotesque creatures, but God describes them this way because that's their nature. They're beastly. They're ravenous. They're perilous. They're, they're uh, terrible. And that's, the, that's what they are. But, uh, but these two beasts that come up in chapter 13 are two is a demonstration of Satan's of wire leaders cast. that take over in the mid, right, at, right in the middle of tribulation and begin the last half of tribulation, which is called Great Tribulation, where the Jews will have to run for their lives, where they'll be hunted on the Judean hills, where it, the hounds of hell will be barking at their, at their heels. You know, they'll be running for their lives. And if it weren't for um, Gentile nations, Gentile people, that God has prepared to take this care of them. This is a demonstration of wire cast. Them, then the Jews would be no more. There would, he would kill every one of them. And we've already seen um, warm-ups to this all through history. Uh, the most hated people on the earth, the most uh, hunted people on the earth, the most despised people on the earth. Uh, the purest race on the earth, you know, I mean, even in spite of all of that, uh, God has somehow managed to keep them whole and bring them to a point where they are now, where this is a all of these events of can begin to happen. And so I want to go back to verse 13 of chapter 2 and get a run in because I know that um, just starting with chapter, verse 1 of chapter 13, you might kind of need to kind of get a little warm up. You might need to kind of look back in a second. You remember in chapter 12, we have the woman, and that's the one who is seen in heaven as birthing the child, the male child, and the dragon is flying and trying to eat the child, trying to kill the child when it's born, but, but, the, but the male child escapes. This is which a demonstration the male, the, of wire The, the mother is Israel, and the male child is Jesus. And in spite of all of the best efforts of Satan, Jesus is born. Satan can't stop him from being born. Satan can't kill him when he is born. And then Satan can't stop his activity. Satan cannot keep Jesus from growing to manhood, having a ministry on earth, dying on the cross for our sins, going into, he going into hell for three days, paradise for three days, bringing back, going to heaven, sprinkling his blood on cast. the mercy seat and, and, and being our Savior. He can't stop his birth. He can't stop his action. But uh, that was his intent to do that. And, and then we see, so we see the woman and then we see the war. And the war was a war that happens in heaven. Now, there was a war that happened in heaven before the earth began. And it was a war that's described in Isaiah chapter 14. And this war was between Lucifer, who was one of God's angels. He was called the anointed this is angel, a the anointed of wire cast. cherub, cherubim angel that covered the throne. And this just means that Lucifer was the praise leader in heaven. Uh, he led the praise to God the Father and God the Son. And that was his job in heaven, and he was beautiful. And Isaiah describes him about how wonderful his voice was, how beautiful his countenance was, how marvelous, what a tremendous creation that he was. But, of course, pride was this found in him. This is a demonstration him, of the wire How the scripture describes it. And he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above God. I'm going to be greater than God. I'm, you know, God's going, to, God's going to be subservient to me. And all of you guys that want to go with me, come on. And, of course, uh, by the book of Revelation, mentioning a third of the, of the stars fell and so forth, uh, we're convinced that a third of the angels went with him. And a third of the angels fell with Lucifer. They were cast out of heaven. This was before there was even... A man on earth. This was before God this created any of that. The first of sin cast. that happened in the 
history of the universe happened in heaven, not on earth. Well, Satan was cast down to the air, and, and I'm trying to make a distinction because he gets cast down again here in the book of Revelation, and it's from the air to the earth. In other words, he gets cast out of heaven into the prince of the power of the air, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, uh, all the ways that the scripture describes him in, in our day, the day we're living in now, this Satan a demonstration has of wire complete cast. access into heaven. And you'll, we'll read a passage in just a second that you'll, it'll say just that. But I've quoted it a bunch of times, and you know it. And it's that right now, Satan is an accuser of the brethren. And he stands before God day and night accusing the brethren. So from that, we should understand that from the time that Kate, Satan was cast out originally, he was cast into the air and became the prince of the power of the air, the, the spiritual wickedness this in high places. This is a places. demonstration of wire cast. Uh, and he became a tempter of mankind with access into heaven to come before God and to accuse us before God anytime he pleased. So the angels had to stand by and watch Satan stomp into heaven and go before God and start accusing us and ridiculing us and mocking us and and putting down on us and hammering us. And so heaven was, uh, until, until this time, was this filled with basically accusations. And then, of course, when this second war happens in heaven, and it's described that this war happens with Michael, the archangel. archangel. Michael is one of the three archangels, which means the highest angels, there are only, there, well, there may be more than three, but only three are named. Michael is one, Gabriel is the other, and Lucifer was the other. Those are the only three angels that are named for us. So we, you know, considering that, you this think, okay, there are three archangels, of Michael, cast. Gabriel, and Lucifer. Well, <clears throat> the war that happens in the book of Revelation is with Michael, the archangel that has been given charge of taking care of Israel. Michael is the warring angel. Gabriel is the announcing angel or like the messenger angel. It was Gabriel that came to Mary, you know, and told her that she was with child and that she was honored above all women and don't be afraid. That was Gabriel. Well, Michael was given charge of Israel to make sure that this there was is a an Israel when it came cast. time for one and to protect them and to keep them sealed and safe. And that's Michael's job. Well, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 12, a war in heaven is described. Now, this war takes place in the, toward the middle of the of tribulation period. You remember in, um, in chapter 8, you have the, the sounding of the trumpets, and you remember the hail and fire come down, and then the meteor comes down, and then wormwood comes down. This is a demonstration and then the water, of the, cast. the good water is, is uh, made bitter and all of that kind of stuff. And then the fifth trumpet sounds, and it said, and I saw a star fall from heaven with the keys to the abyss. And he opened up the abyss, and out came these demon locusts. You remember that? And then the sixth trumpet sound, and World War III started on the earth where all the armies of the, of the East, not the Far East, not China, Japan, <laughs> India, but the East like Iran, is a Afghanistan, of uh, northern, eastern part of Russia, all of that, that part of the East came toward Israel, uh, African countries, Egypt, Libya, uh, came up from the South, um, Turkey and Russia came down from the North, and they were all moving against, against tiny little Israel. And um, Israel miraculously defeats them. I'm sure Michael had a big hand in that. And in Ezekiel 38 and 39, this that is war is described. Of wire cast. And it is said that Israel so totally annihilates these, all of the armies of the world that uh, Israel lives off of the leftovers, the residue, the power, the, the, the diesel fuel, the gasoline, the, the ar artillery, the, the, all, everything that the enemies were coming against, they not only defeat the enemy, they get all their weapons, and they use those weapons for seven years, you know, the power off of them, which, uh, you know, corresponds, obviously. This is a demonstration of, of wire cast. So, so the point being that 
this is where we are. We're, we're at a point where we've had seals broken and we've had trumpets sounded and all of these seals are releases of, 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 of spirit and, and, and restraints that have held things back. And, and so the earth just becomes more and more dominated by the same old evil that we see right now, except it's on steroids and it doesn't have any restraint and the Holy Spirit is not there holding everything back. We're in heaven. This the church is, is gone. Of um, everybody with any sense has left this earth, you know, and the only people left on this earth are people that are non-believers or uh, atheists or people that have never received Christ. There is no Holy Spirit to make people think about things and to cause them to be restrained in any way. So the earth just begins to spiral out of control. And then the trumpets start sounding and catastrophes start happening on the earth. And the earth starts being bombed with all kind of physical things that start happening on the earth this that change the physical structure of, of the earth. And men become more hardened against God, and you would think they would repent. Some people do get saved because God's plan included during the first three and a half years of tribulation that there were two witnesses. You remember these two witnesses that uh, we think are probably Elijah and Enoch because they're the only two people that have ever left the earth without dying. And the Bible says in Hebrews, as it is appointed unto man, this wants to die and after that judgment. So these are the only two that have never died. Everybody else that's ever lived on this earth has died at least once. And so, you know, I'm not sure. Don't, don't stand before God one day and say, I know, I know, it's Elijah and Enoch. You know, and then God say, wrong, you know, and then you be disappointed. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> right, that's what our pastor there he is right there, that guy with the mane right over there. You see him? Yeah, yeah, that's him right there. You see him flipping this his hair? That's him right there. But, uh, but and I'll look at you and go, you know, like that. But uh, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know that it, that it will literally be those two guys. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it is now. Don't get me wrong because, you know, here's the thing about it. In order for them to have any impact upon the people that they're intended to have impact, they're going to have to be, uh, yeah, they're going to have to appear uh, to be authentic. This and, is a demonstration you know, of Wirecast. Uh, Elijah would be a prophet that any Jewish person would respect and honor and listen to because he's one of their heroes. And Enoch, although we don't know a lot about him, uh, if you read church history and you and, and you understand some of the writings of historic uh, uh, prophecy and so forth, Enoch has a book called the Book of Enoch. It didn't make it into the Scripture, but it is considered a holy book, and it was studied by the Jews, and they have great uh, authority with it, and they a lot of some of their think customs this and some of their teachings come from that. And so Enoch then again would be somebody the Jews would would listen to, and they have to be able to listen to him because the two prophets, the two the two witnesses that come, they're going to be so powerful. Remember, they they shoot fire out of their mouth, and they can call plagues down, and they can they can do anything they want to, and uh, the Antichrist can't do a thing about it, and the beast can't do a thing about it, and the dragon can't do a thing about it until God allows them to do it and at the in the middle of tribulation uh god allows this is a the antichrist to kill Wirecast. them on the streets of jerusalem you remember this and their bodies lay there for three days in the streets of jerusalem they don't even bury them so that everybody that wants to come by and look at them can come by and look at them and mock them and ridicule them and stomp on them and do anything they want to to them desecrate their bodies spit on them whatever they want to do and, and literally, the scripture says in Revelation that, that we've read, that, that I think it's chapter 11, that these people start giving each other gifts because, you know, it's kind of like, a, I'm, I'm thinking a like uh, the Wizard of Oz cast. and the Wicked Witch of the West is dead. Or the, was it the East? The East. Was it the East or the West? The West. Okay, Wicked Witch of the West. Anyway, the one that got melted, you know, I melted. Anyway, you remember, ding dong, the wicked's dead, the wicked old witch, wicked witch, ding dong, wicked. Yeah, I imagine some kind of scene like that, where the people are going through the streets making up uh, death carols for the two witnesses. Yeah. yeah, celebrating the death of the two witnesses. Because evidently these guys have so harassed this them and so of uh, plagued them 
and just show up without notice and just hammer them and just spoil their fun and, and condemn them and pre preach judgment and, and they can't do a thing about it. And now they're dead and it's like, whoa, celebrate everybody, they're dead. Well, these two witnesses, I think, have in their preaching helped 144,000 Apostle Pauls, 144,000 Jewish cast. evangelists. Well, actually, now, just to be technical about it, the, the Scripture doesn't say that they're evangelists. It just says that 144,000 are sealed by God, 12,000 from each tribe. The 12 tribes of Judah, 12,000 from each tribe, therefore 144,000 Jews. But the reason that I think they're evangelists is because, I mean, that's the only reason to seal them. I, I, there wouldn't be any other reason, I don't think. I mean, why would you, be, why would you seal 144,000 Jews is a if they're not going to be used cast. to do something special during the, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation? I mean, and, and then there, where you see them, the 144,000, is right after you see a bunch of martyred people that are under the throne, under the altar in heaven, that are crying out, to avenge their blood. How long are you going to let this go on? How long are you not going to avenge our blood? How you know, you have these people that obviously have come to Christ and have been killed, been martyred during the tribulation period. They're, this that, is that, a demonstration that They're already of in cast. heaven, but they're underneath the altar, and they're cry their blood is crying out. Just like, you know, in, in, when Abel was killed, you remember in Genesis, Cain kills Abel, and then God comes down and says... Uh, Hey, where's Abel? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And God says, yeah, and his blood is crying out to me. So just like Abel's blood cried out in Genesis, these martyrs' blood crying out under the altar, how long are you going to go without avenging us and so forth? Well, because this the 144,000 are mentioned right cast. after them, the, the implication is the 144,000 are the reason why we have some martyrs because they preach the gospel. These people heard him preach the gospel, came to Jesus, and died for it. So anyway, so you have all of that going on in heaven, and then chapter 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 all come in here to say, okay, meanwhile, back in heaven, and, and that's what these chapters are about. This you have all this stuff happening on earth. So we're at, we're, at, we're halfway. We're at the point where the three woe trumpets. You remember the trumpets that sounded? They said, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And it was saying, okay, we're going to have th the next three trumpets are going to just start being terrible on the earth. And the first one were those demon locusts that came out. And the second one was the world war that hit. And then the third one, when it sounded, then you started pouring out the vials on the earth. This is so a right now, of we've had two cast. woe trumpets sound and everything's breaking loose on earth and the Antichrist is deceiving and he's still charming and wonderful and he's still promising the Jews that he's their man, he's their friend, he's got their back, he's going to take care of them. He gives them back the where the dome of the rock is. And, and they say, well, hey, man, I mean, shoot, this guy, he's, he's our man. He's looking out after us. And even though this I don't think, a a minute, of I test. don't think he's a Jew. I think he's a Gentile. Even though he's not a Jew, they're still going to believe and trust him. I mean, they're not, I mean, he's not their Messiah, uh, but, but he's a good man in, in looking out for them. And so they trust him. And, and see, he's this one that has gone forth on that white horse. He's that one that looks like a, he has a crown and, and pretends to be a king, but he's not a king. I mean, you know, he might have run a, won a race, but he ain't no king, you know. And, and so this they're going to be looking at him as somebody that's going to be good to them and great for them and, and it'll help them and take care of them and all of that kind of stuff. And then he's about to betray them and, and show his real colors and things are going to break loose on earth. So... Um, let me let me just start reading with verse uh, with verse thirteen. Is that what's up there? No, the woes up there. Let me see if I can get this to come up. All right, all right. Did I get it? Yeah, there it is. Now, when the drag this is chapter twelve, and we're running into chapter thirteen. Now, when the dragon saw that he had this been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So, 
this is a description of the fact that when the war in heaven started and Michael kicked him out, all right, he gets kicked this time not to the air where he was, but he gets kicked to earth. So he's on his downward progression. You remember I told you that every time something happens to, to the devil, he just gets, goes down lower and lower. He gets kicked from heaven to the air. He gets kicked from the air down to earth. He gets from the earth to the abyss. He gets from the abyss down to the lake of fire. I mean, this he's on his way. Everything that happens to him from now on is down. So now, he's, he, now he not only can't stop the male child from being born, now he's been kicked out of heaven and he doesn't have access into heaven anymore, which is why you're going to see a celebration start in just a second. And he's cast down to earth where he knows he has only a short season. So he is more enraged than ever. And he, start, he begins to try to, um, to attack the Jews. He begins to this try to kill them. This is a demonstration I mean, of why He makes cast. war to the, to, the, to the woman who gave birth to the male child, which is Israel. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, implying that God has a place prepared for Israel to keep her safe during these last three and a half years of tribulation. Because if God didn't have a place prepared the Antichrist would annihilate Israel off the earth. He'd kill every Jew in the world. Um, I mean, and he would have the power to do that too. But God's got a place prepared for you. Evidently, some people are going to take care of it. This is a them. demonstration I don't of know Wirecast. if it'll be the United States. I don't care. I don't know if it'll be some of the Western world, you know, but somebody's going to take care of her because he's got a place prepared for her and she's going to have to fly on eagle's wings to that place so that she can fly out of his sight and jurisdiction and, and somehow where he can't get to her where she is nourished, the verse goes on to say, for a time and times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. So time is one, times is two more, which now we this got three a and a half times, which is a half. Cast. So for three and a half years, which is the last three and a half years where great tribulation starts, Israel is going to be preserved and hidden by God and taken care of and so forth. And the Antichrist is going to be looking for them, trying to kill them, trying to find them. Uh, every Jew he finds, he's going to kill. Um, I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be a very treacherous, deadly, horrible time for the Jews on this earth. And the dragon, let me get you up there. I don't, this see, I can't is a see demonstration of so wire cast. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, yeah, to put it mildly. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who kept the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. So even though he tries to kill all of the Jews, he can't get all of them. And some of them are going to miraculously come to Christ even during this time. They're going to be persuaded. And so he's going to, the description here is that his this intent is, is to of annihilate them. He's enraged. He's, he knows he has a short season. He knows he's been kicked out of heaven. He's kicked down to the earth. He's, and, he's, and he's just doing anything he can to harm and harass and, and, and kill Israel and destroy the earth. And uh, it's just that horrible last. That's why Jesus said it's great tribulation like this world has never seen and shall never see. Matthew 24 and 25, if you want to read what Jesus has to say about this a lot a of these times. As a matter of fact, I think cast. I shared this with you. I know I did last week. That a lot of Matthew 25, when you read it, you know, you read things like, when I was in jail, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. Uh, that happened. That technically is our passages that deal with this time period. You know, every scripture has its, um, has its context. Now, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's all profitable this for doctrine, is a demonstration for correction, of cast. for instruction, for reproof in righteousness, that the man of God would be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, is what the Bible says. So, don't get me wrong. I'm, I mean, every passage has spiritual application. It has purposeful transport to, to teach us to be generous and kind and faithful and loving and all of that. So I'm not just saying that Matthew 25 about feeding people and visit them in jail and, and when you've done it to the least of one of these, of my brothers, you've done it unto me, that that, 
that, that that doesn't mean that we ought not try to take care of people and help people in need and so forth. I'm not saying that, but, but I'm just saying if you want to know what that scripture really means, this is what it means. It, it is during this time that that passage is identified when Jesus is telling his disciples what it's going to be like at the end of the age. And he, that's, when, that's when he says that about visiting me and so forth. So, so he's telling them this that if, if you don't take of care cast. of the Jews, the least of these, my brothers, in these days, they're not going to make it through these days. So somebody's going to have to take care of them. Now, while that's happening and that's going on, uh, here's what starts happening on earth. All right, let me see if I can. <laughs> I get this thing. I need to get my little screen back there. I'm sorry, y'all. I can't. I mean, this this will, be, this will help me better. All right. A be there are two beasts that come this up during a chapter 13. This is demonstration of wire cast. One of them is a beast from the sea, and one is a beast from the earth. All right. Let's look at the beast of the beast from the sea. Now, let me just say this because I, I did look this up, and, and uh, I mean, I'm not I'm I'm not a Greek scholar. Uh, or a Hebrew scholar, I'm, uh, you know, I study Greek and I study Hebrew just like everybody else who doesn't speak the language. I study lexicons and I studied uh, translations and so forth. And I just want to tell you that on this first part of this verse, there this is, is a demonstration in some of manuscripts, there, there is a little different wording on this. And, um, and so I want you to see it. John said, then I stood on the sand of the sea in some transcripts that says, and he stood on the sand of the sea, instead of and I, it is and he, which would make the, the meaning of that totally different. You know, it would make it where John's not standing there on the sand of the sea, but the beast is standing on the sand of the sea. The dragon is standing on the sand of the sea. And the dragon stood on the of sand of the sea. It doesn't really matter because the same thing's gonna happen regardless of what, but it just wants you to know that. Uh, so the, the dragon stands on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So here's what John is seeing. John is saying, all right, now what happens on earth is all of a sudden the dragon who is Satan, and you'll see him described that very this clearly in just a moment in the next few verses. No doubt who the dragon is. The dragon stands on the sands of the sea and calls up a beast out of the sea. Well, of course, we're looking for a sign. You remember in chapter 12, John said that he started seeing a sign in heaven. And the sign was this dragon and these heads and horns and stuff. So when you see that, what you have to understand is that, okay, we're, John is about to describe this is a something demonstration to us of that is not cast. literal. And by not literal, I mean it's not really a dragon flying around with seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns. That, that is symbolic of something. That symbolizes something. When he says, I'm, I saw a sign, he's telling you that this is a sign. This is not literal. This means something. So, of course, in chapter 13, you're seeing this, still seeing the same dragon, and you're seeing him come this up out of the sea, and you're seeing him on the earth cast. and all that. So what could that be? Well, if you go back, like I said, to the book of Daniel, Daniel describes the same beast coming up out of the sea which Daniel says back in Daniel chapter 7 that these beasts coming up out of the sea are nations. So when you see a dragon coming up out of the sea, it's talking about here is something that comes out of the sea of humanity. The this sea represents the, the, of the empires cast. of the world. It represents the fact that these Gentile powers in the book of Daniel, which are and he identifies them as Greece is the leopard, swift, fast as lightning. Alexander the Great rules the world. Uh, the Medo-Persian, which are, are, are powerful and, 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 uh, and potent, and that was Darius the Mede in the Medo-Persian Empire. They're the, they're the bear. And then the lion with its gaping mouth and crushing jaws and so forth. This is a demonstration uh, is, uh, of wire cast. Is Babylon, powerful 
and then the Roman Empire is the last beast, and it's kind of an amalgamation of all of them, and it's the most powerful of all. So Daniel says that there are four world powers that come out of the sea of the of the sea of humanity. So when we see a dragon come out of the sea here, we're thinking, okay, we've already, Dan, Daniel's already told us that the sea means a sea of humanity. It means they're called out of a out of a Gentile world, out of this a world empire. This is a demonstration empire. of wire cast. So this is one reason why I say I believe the Antichrist is Gentile, because he's called out of the sea. This first beast that comes out of the sea is the Antichrist. He's the beast that is uh, on the earth, the human that's trying, that's deceiving everyone. Look at how it, look at what it says happened. He has seven heads and ten horns. All this means is the ten, the ten horns represent power. And I'm not going to get into all the minutia, but just to say this, that nobody knows who the, who the nations are that are going to make up this, this confederacy at the end of, of the world cast. that has this power. But according to the ten heads, when you see a horn in the scripture, it represents power. So the ten horns on the ten heads, uh, on the seven heads, represent ten world powers that are going to come into control of the world at, in these days. It's called the revived Roman Empire because the Roman Empire covered Europe and was a confederation of different nations this is a demonstration of wire cast. Well, at the end of time, John says there's going to be a confederation like that, and they're going to be, they're going to be ten of these nations that are going to have power over the whole world, and 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 not to make it more confusing, but the seven heads are the seven leaders of these ten nations. Even though there are ten nations, they only have seven leaders. So the seven heads are the seven leaders of the ten horns, which are the ten nations that have the crown that control the world. This so is a demonstration the other, of you, you remember cast. back in chapter 12, and I know this is probably just adding more confusion than anything else, but just to show you that they came from the same family as the dragon, you remember how the dragon was described back in chapter 12? If I can get that to come up, maybe. Uh, I just want you to see, let's see, uh, what he looked like. He had, okay. Here he is. Let me see if I can get that. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads. Okay, there's the seven heads this again. This is a demonstration and ten of horns. There's cast. the ten horns. And seven diadems on his heads. So the dragon has ten, seven heads, ten horns, and he's got crowns on his head. His boy, the Antichrist, <laughs> Has comes out of the same family. He has seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns on the horn, on each horn. Uh, j just to show you that they come from the same family. Just I don't know if you if that matters to you or not. It, it's just a one of those interesting. This kind of things is a demonstration of wire right. cast. So then he's described. Let me see if I can. Get, I can't get it. Go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not it. Well, I thought I could get. Is that it? Mm mm. Mm mm. That's 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 not it. All right, come on, I'm gonna get you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there he is. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his ten this on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now, uh, verse two. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, which is the same thing Daniel saw. You remember, he was like a leopard. And his feet were like a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. All right, so just suffice it to say, all right, the Antichrist is going to be empowered with the power from Satan. He's going to be satanically empowered. And, he's, and he's get, we're a given a description of, of how he's going, be, he's going to be swift like a leopard. I mean, you know, when I think of a leopard, I think like, all right, spotted leopard. All right, I think, okay, the devil has a spotted leopard and Jesus is the spotless lamb. I mean, you know, just kind of think of that. All right, uh, the bear uh, crushes, uh, leaves a trail of blood. Jesus left on his own blood. Uh, the, the lion, you know, his gaping mouth and his crushing draws. And when I think of Jesus, uh, the scripture says, no one ever spoke like Jesus, you know. So in other words, the contrast is what I'd like this for you to see, is a but demonstration he's, he, of this is cast. the Antichrist. This is the one that's called up out of the out of the 
uh, out of the uh, nations, and he's going to be controlled. But notice that he is, uh, he is, he he gets his authority from the dragon. All right, now here's where things begin to get a little bit more supernatural. And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they this worshiped the dragon of who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? All right, now, here's what happens. One of the heads, you remember I said the seven heads represent the seven leaders that rule the ten empires, the world powers, and one of those heads, evidently the one that represents the Antichrist, is going to be wounded. More, it says mortally wounded, implying that he's, this he's dead. This is a demonstration of why So cast. somehow the Antichrist is going to be killed. Now, the only one that would have power enough to do that would be one of the two witnesses. You know, I mean, they, they would be the only one with enough power. I mean, who's going to kill the Antichrist? other than somebody who is supernaturally empowered like, like one of the two witnesses. I'm, I'm just speculating. Now, don't, don't get to heaven, you know, and say anything about this. Just, you know, this, just, this would just be between us, you know. <laughs> and you guys, if you're watching by now, if you hadn't cut it off. This um, is a demonstration you know, of Don't say cast. anything about that, all right? When you get to heaven, God might laugh. But, but the, point, the point is somebody has to do it. Somebody has to mortally wound him. Wound him. I mean, I don't think he committed suicide. So the head that represents the Antichrist is mortally wounded, and, and, and this, this, this deadly wound is healed. So the Antichrist is killed, and then he comes back to life. This is a demonstration of Does that remind of you of anything cast. else you might have heard of before? Would you, do you think this would be an imitation, a cheap imitation of the real thing? Wouldn't this be an imitation of, of Jesus and suffering the mortal wound on the cross and going to heaven and being resurrected? So in other words, I mean, the devil tries to copy everything God does and tries to imitate everything God does. Yeah, and as, as a matter of fact, and you know, right. this is a demonstration of wire cast. Right. Yeah, they're going to see that. Right, and, and you know, this may be part of what, what, what I quote so often in Second Thessalonians about, uh, and God is going to send them strong delusion that they would believe the lie, that they might perish who know not God because when they had an opportunity to receive truth, they rejected truth because they love sin more than they love righteousness is what Thessalonians says. This could be part of the lie. This could be a part of that delusion and lie this because when the people see this they're cast. going to fall for this and and they're going to look at the antichrist and, and, and you know and the thing about it is they may know they may know that this is not a godly thing they may know that this is a satanic thing but whether they know it or not they're going to they're going to e become even more committed to the to the antichrist because they're going to look at him as a resurrected person, you know, as some kind of supernatural power. And, and, and that, little, that little phrase, who is like the beast, that's a mockery of God. This is a demonstration of, of wire cast. That's what that says, you know, in the scripture, uh, many times it says, and who is like our God, and who is able to, who is worthy of our God, and who is holy like our God. That's, that, that's what that really is. That's a, that's a mockery. Who is like the beast? Yeah. Yeah, who is like the beast? In other words, uh, if you can't even kill him, who can, who can stand up against the beast? And so he's, he's really even given more allegiance. Now, this is uh, uh, another thought about that or a little deeper addition to that. This is a demonstration of wire earth, cast. The beast is a human being. He is called up out of the sea of humanity. He is like Greece was an empire. Babylon was an empire. Uh, Medio Persians were an empire. Rome was an empire. I mean, those are real people. Those are not supernatural beings. Those are real human beings that live on the earth. Well, the Antichrist is going to be a real human being that lives on the earth. He's going to be a political person. He's going to be a person that uh, takes over the world. He's the rider of the white horse. He uh, rules the world. He's a political leader. He's charming. He's wonderful. He's 
uh, <laughs> captivating. Uh, he's, he, he promises everything, whether he can deliver or not. He promises it, and they believe him, and he gives Israel back, gives Jerusalem back to the Jewish people where the mosque of Omar is. They can build their temple. He probably encourages them to build their temple and, hey, have your sacrifices. He, he, he's a political leader. He's a real human being, political person, like flesh and blood, like us. Well, now he gets wounded mortally, and now he gets resurrected. Well, of course, now he's more dominated by Satan than ever. I mean, he, he, it's like, okay, he gets mortally wounded. He goes into the abyss. He comes out of the abyss. Now he's resurrected. He's demon, you know. I mean, he's, he's, he, he's, he's powerful. He's, he's more than a human being now. This is... I mean, Satan totally has dominance over the Antichrist. And so he's, uh, he becomes the world leader. And then uh, here's what he does. And, when, and he was given a mouth. Now, notice, I'm, I'm going to read this. And so you just notice how often it says, and he was given. So you'll know where his power comes from. It comes from the dragon who is given in power. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. How many? How, how long is 42 months? Three and a half years. So here we go. Last three and a half years. He was given this power for the last three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Now, it's interesting that uh, even though he has all this power, uh, all he can do is talk <laughs> and blaspheme and criticize. I mean, he can't get back into heaven, so all he can do is stand on earth and, and, and blaspheme God and blaspheme the people of God and blaspheme the temple in heaven and the tabernacle in heaven. I mean, it's, it's really kind of interesting. And those who dwell in heaven, and it was granted to him to make war with the saints. Those are the few saints that might be left on the earth, the Jewish people who have come to Christ, just like the martyrs that have died, because all of the Jews, there will be some that will believe in the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Notice all of this was given to him. He has, God has given him the ability to do this. The dragon has empowered him to do this. He, he, this is not on his own. And, and if God didn't give him the power to do this, he wouldn't, ha wouldn't be able to have the power to do this. And all who dwell on earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the whole world is going gonna, is gonna to fall in love with him. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. By the way, that's the last time that phrase appears in the whole book of Revelation. So in other words, from this point, this is your last time to hear this and change your ways. Last time you hear this, come to Christ. You still have time. This is the last time it's ever said. If anyone is going into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone's killed with the sword, this, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on part of God's people. That's just a, an encouraging line. Now, the beast from the earth. Remember I told you there are two beasts that are introduced in chapter 13. The beast from the sea. The sea is the sea of humanity, the Gentile nations of the world. So the Antichrist comes from the Gentile nations of the world. Now look at this one. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So the, this one's not out of the sea, it's out of the earth. As a matter of fact, one of the translations is coming up out of the land, which most likely means the land of Israel. So this guy is most likely a Jew. Because this one is going to be the one that's really treacherous uh, and, and does a tremendous disservice to the Jews. Notice what he had. And he had two horns like a lamb. Could be a, could be a, a priest, you know, a Jewish priest. Could be, because this person's going to be tremendously familiar with the temple and the services and the sacrifices. I mean, this person's going to be uh, operating in the, in the spiritual realm of life. This is not a political leader. The Antichrist is a political leader. This is a religious leader. And, 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 and so he has two horns like a lamb, but God says, don't make any mistake, and he spoke like a dragon. In other words, he may look like a lamb, but he ain't a lamb, he's a dragon. He's got, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So in other words, when, when, when he's in the presence of the dragon, he has all of this power, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. By the way, it's mentioned about five times in this chapter, and his deadly wound was healed. 
Remember, his deadly wound was healed. His wound was healed. <laughs> As if that's a really important thing to remember. Because it is. Because it's what makes people think he's legit. You know? It's what makes people... Or, and, 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 and just... And I know y'all know this because, you know, you've, you've lived on the earth a long time. Um, almost everybody that's ever had a head wound has been described as the Antichrist because of that kind of stuff right there. You know, John Kennedy, if he had come back to life in that Dallas hospital, uh, he had been the Antichrist, you know what I mean? Um, or anybody else, you know, that has had a deadly head wound. Abraham Lincoln, my, you know, if he comes back on the earth, you know, he's going to be the Antichrist. But, yeah, but, <clears throat> yeah. Dead. yeah, right, right. Jesus, it was he was dead. Right. Yeah. He didn't just swoon, did he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he does. He does. Satan does have miracles. They're, they're imitations, but, they're, but they are real. I mean, they really do happen. But anyway, and he exercises all the authority uh, and, uh, and the beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this guy is a religious person who is the propaganda agent for the, for the Antichrist. This is the guy who uh, persuades the world, the religious world, to worship the Antichrist. Uh, he is a religious person who is uh, the press secretary, so to speak, of the Antichrist. This, is, this person is called the false prophet. You remember I said in, in the... In the creation of things, there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? God is triune, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the devil's also triune. He is the Antichrist, which is the anti of Jesus. He is the false prophet, which is the anti-Holy Spirit. And he is the dragon, which is the anti-God. So here we're introduced now. We had the dragon flying around. So you got Satan flying around. He's the dragon. And now you got the Antichrist, which is the, is the anti to Jesus. And then now you have this beast from the earth that gives, that is the, the, the persuader, the propaganda agent, the, uh, the enhancer of the, of, the, of the Antichrist. And he's called the false prophet. And he's going to lead the people to do all kinds of stuff. Listen, just, uh, just see what he does. Say, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, in contrast to Jesus, just remember, you remember Jesus when he was on earth, that people tried to get Jesus to do signs all the time. You remember? He said, if you're the son of man, you know, get us down off this cross. Uh, do us a jig. Perform us a miracle. and Give us a trick. And Jesus said, you know, you'll not see any miracle. I'll not do any miracles except the sign of Jonah, you know. I mean, he, he said, yeah, you're going to see one, all right. But when you see it, it's going to be that I, just like Jonah went in the belly of the well three days and three nights and came out alive, I'm going in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and then I'm coming out alive. So Jesus refused to perform miracles in the sight of men, but this guy, he jumps at the chance to perform miracles in the sight of people because that's going to be one of the persuasions that he has. And so he performs these great signs and even makes fire come down. And this, is, and, and this is his greatest work right here. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. And notice he's granted to do these things. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. There it is again. So he, he gets everybody together and he says, you know what we need to do? We need to make an image of this great this great figure, he probably won't call him the beast or the Antichrist, but let our leader, our great world leader, we need to make an image. He is so tremendous. He is so wonderful. You know he resurrected from life. And we need to make this tremendous image, and we need to worship this image because nobody is like the beast, you know. And that's what he's going to be doing. And he, and he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. And that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this guy actually brings the image of the beast that was built to life. And this, and this image is able to kill people if they won't bow down and worship him. 
<laughs> and here's the last couple of verses. And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now, just one little word about that. This is dealing with um, something that is uh, intended to be obvious. It's intended to be um, noticeable. Uh, or else it wouldn't be demanded to be on your right hand or your forehead. I mean, obviously, the beast wants this, this mark to be, uh, to, to be noticed. And it's going to most likely be some type of something like a tattoo or something like that. I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of what we have now. In other words, it's not going to be some invisible something that nobody can see and has to be scanned under some scanner or black light. It's going to be something that's completely obvious or else he would have said, hey, put it on your belly button, you know. He, no, he said, put it on the back of your wrist because we want it to be obvious and put it on your forehead because we want to see it. You know, we want everybody else to see it too. And, of course, he says that, everybody's going to have to have this mark. The tiniest little child is going to have. I mean, and, and whether you're a, a multi-billion dollar business that wants to do business in the world, you, you either have to have the mark or you're not going to get to do business. If you're a child going down to the ice cream stand or the snowball stand, if you don't have a mark, you're not going to be able to buy a snowball. I mean, this, is, con, this includes everyone, small and great, free and slave, calls them to to receive a mark on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So God tells us that coming in the last day Three and a half years of tribulation is the, are these two tremendous beasts that hit this earth. They're empowered by Satan himself, that old dragon, that ancient serpent, you know, who, who stands before God and accuses us day and night. And he's going to be joined by a propaganda agent who is most likely a religious person, most likely, I believe, a Jewish person, who will cause... Uh, people of this earth to have confidence in the beast, to believe in the beast, to trust him and to bow down and worship him. And then all of a sudden now, uh, here comes some economic restraints and people are going to do this. I mean, what's the alternative really? You know, some people are going to be convinced that this is necessary. You know, we have we have people that are globalists, and they think, okay, the whole world needs to get together, and we need to do these things together. And, you know, I guess it's all right for us to have something like this because this will make things easier, and it won't be such a hassle in life. And then some people will be, oh, I don't care if I have the mark. Who cares? What difference does it make? And then some people are going to be, hey, if I don't have the mark, I'm, I can't, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. So, but no matter what your motive is, the point is you're going to have to have it or you out of business. Yeah, Rick, did you have a question or I'll speak? I think it is. No, no, I think it's literal. I think it's literal. I think it actually, and the, and the reason I say this is because of where he says to put it. You know, I mean, it, it, if it wasn't intended to be obvious and physical and real, then the, the hand, I mean, there would be no reason to say put it there yeah. or put it there because why? I, yeah. Visible, yeah, yeah, right. Is it, I mean, is it actually going to be the number 666 or is it going to be something visual and obvious of something mm -hmm. that we don't know yet that 666 is symbolic of it? That's what I think. I think that. Um, and the reason I'm saying this, you understand what Rick was asking. He said, do, do I think it's going to be literally the number 666 or is that number just symbolic of some other number that it might be? And, and I'm, I'm going to tell you that I don't think it's going to be 666. I think it's, and, and here's why. Because look, look at the sentence, look at the verse, what it says. All right, here is wisdom. All right, let me back up and get these other two verses because they're going to come. All right, verse 17, let's just look at it. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or 
the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that verse is saying that this number that you're going to have can, can represent the beast or his name or some number that represents him. So, and then it goes on to say, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666, all right? Six in, in, in biblical scriptural numerics is, is, stands for the weakness of man. It's one less than God. Number seven is complete. Uh, six is incomplete. It's, it, it's missing one. It's one less than God. Man was created on the sixth day. Uh, six represents mankind. So the, the point I think here is 666 six, six is just basically like an intensification of the weakness of man. It, it's a number that stands for a man, and I think it's going to be a number that only exists when, when, when this stuff starts happening. I think there will be something in the economy of the world or in the economics of the world, or the political activity of the world that will exist in this day. And anybody who knows that, that um, there is going to be some type of symbolic number that represents the beast that you can't take the mark of, and they will be able to calculate it in that day. We, uh, herein is wisdom. In other words, if you have wisdom, you're going to be able to know something is up. And you're going to be able to, to understand that this beast has a number. And if you put that number on you, then you're going to be doomed. So I, I, I don't think it's literally going to be 666. I think it's going to be something. It'll be, a num it'll be some type of number. It'll be some type of calculation that is formed, I think, in those days, that the people of those days will understand that this is a calculation that represents a, a certain entity on this earth, you know, and, and that they'll know that in that day. And if they pay attention and they have wisdom and they have been taught any of this, they will know, don't take that number because it's going to seal your fate and so forth. Because believe me, when these vials get poured out, the people that have that mark of that beast on them, whoo, it's going to be really bad for them. I mean, it's going to be tough. That's, God begins to pour his wrath out in just, just a minute here. And it's going to be tough. So anyway, there you go. All right, now, uh, you have any questions about that? Has that been completely confusing to you? Have you have you turned upside down and say, man, I'm getting out of here. I'm never coming back. That's ridiculous. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Rick. Thank you. I, I, sh I do. I appreciate that. And I, and I know I know with everybody in here, it may not be your cup, total cup of tea, you know, and you may be going, oh, man. Uh, you know, but but it is uh, it is part of the Word of God, and He says we'll be blessed if we understand it and see it and know it. Oh, it. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. He said, He said, you'll I'll bless you if you'll study this. I'll bless you if you'll know this. I'll bless you if you'll read this and understand this. And so, uh, I, I you know, obviously, I'm just I'm trying to do the best I can to to make it palatable to you and, and not get too bogged down in the minutia of everything so that you lose the, the flow of any, what, what's even happening here on earth. So, so far, we're about halfway through. The Great Tribulation is just on the verge of starting where horrible things start happening to people on the earth. The Antichrist goes wild and starts killing people, the Jews. Uh, the false prophet is calling down fire from heaven, and he's like some spiritual demonic force that is empowering this beast and Antichrist. And the dragon is giving them both power to do all of the horrible things they're doing. We're already in heaven. We're looking down on this from above. The Holy Spirit is there with us, and there's no restraint on earth, and God is getting ready to pour out the final bowls of wrath on this whole place. And um, the millennial kingdom will be set up, and then Satan will be loose for a little season, and then he'll be, ca he'll be caught back, cast into the lake of fire, and God will create a new heaven, new earth, and boom, there we'll be. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> We're going to meet in chapter 17, the great, the great 
whore that sits on the throne is the way the Bible calls it. Mystery Babylon. Mm. The religion of the world. All right. Thank you.